Sorry, I'll try to All right, we're gonna get started. Dr. Madeline Kay is presenting the I don't know if he knows this yet, but the first of multiple talks. Yeah. So this is a laser <laughs> pointer and I can destroy your retinas with it. <laughs> so it'll be on the right atrium. This is kind of fun. All right. Well, I hope that this will be uh, interactive. And the first person who's going to interact is Philip. <laughs> So, Philip, if we open up the right atrium on the operating table, and we have this, does this thing work? No, it doesn't. All right, if you have your feet down there and your head up here, and patients lying in front of you, why is the septal leaflet on the bottom? Did anyone lose this napkin? More of a beard section. The septum? It's the right atrium. Uh -huh. And you're saying the septum is posterior? <clears throat> the RV is anterior. And that does, in fact, make the septum posterior. So we 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 often misname things, and uh, you're ab you're absolutely right. So the reason the septum is on the bottom. No, I was just giving you a hard time. So so we have sternum spine, and it's not right and left. It's anterior posterior. So that's gonna. It's important to keep this in mind because it will answer some questions as to why we keep misnaming sometimes. So we have to, we want to kind of get straight how the heart sits in the chest. All right. <clears throat> Caution, what the hell are you reading? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Zenob, which of these is oriented correctly? The one on the left? So this is a person with two hearts and a very big chest. But which one is oriented correctly, the one on the left or the one on the right? If you're just looking, if you were looking at me, would my heart be oriented this way or this way? This way. If I had COPD, maybe, good answer, yes. Right, so the right ventricle anterior, the only part of the left atrium that is visible from the frontal view is this little smidgen of the atrial appendage as it sweeps anterior around the trunk of, oddly enough, here the pulmonary artery because it's a left-sided structure. And of course, the left ventricle only makes a guest appearance as it forms the apex, assuming it is apex forming, which it is in normals. So the heart sits on the diaphragm and it is not right and left. It is anterior, posterior. And just, we're gonna get back to the right ventricle, to the right atrium, because that's what the subject is. But I wanted to point out that the naming conventions actually assume that the heart is oriented in the Valentine fashion. And that's why we have words like posterior. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. The, yeah, I don't know the history of that convention. I, I don't know the history of that convention. But once you take it out of the chest, you can obviously turn it any way you like to look at it. And people may not have thought about how to name it. And then, but then when we get these tomographic techniques, um, or even and uh, even ventriculography, uh, you s all of a sudden start having these inconsistencies in naming. So, in in the conventional uh, scheme, we would call the right ventricle anterior in a lateral X-ray, but we call we say that the left ventricle is a posterior wall. But if we really think about it, something sitting on the diaphragm is inferior. The posterior 
structure. How did, did I do that? Just by touching it? Oops. <laughs> I just wanted to see what would happen. So the posterior chamber is the left atrium. It's the, it's the most posterior chamber. It's next to the spine. So that's why we've dropped the term in the posterior in the echo lab and in other con naming conventions. And we have inferior and lateral. So, so posterior really should refer to the left atrium and inferior to those structures adjacent to the diaphragm. All right. Now, so we'll just stay with the subject of orientation, but stick with the no, return to the right atrium, which is the subject of today's fascinating talk, Kashin. Okay, but you're not looking fascinated. So which is oriented correctly? Jeremy, not not the uh, not the one with the kids. This one. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. Can you tell the two apart? Because Stephen and Jeremy are wearing the same clothes Yeah, yeah, they do look similar. <laughs> they do look similar. So which is oriented correctly? This, or maybe before we get to that, let's make, let's just make sure that we all see everything. So. What do you think ICV stands for? Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> the British, I thought that's what I thought. But it, the British like to say the inferior cable vein. So they don't say vena, so, so the guy who does this doesn't like Latin words. And he, he, he used, and when you translate that into English, cable is an adjective, it goes in front of the noun. So, so this is, this is that. And then we turn it around. We have this, what is this? No, and you, you made me so upset that I changed, I changed the whole, it's the oval fossa. So actually the IVC is down here. So it's a, it, the arrow should be kind of pulled back if it's meant to be the cable thing. So then we have the oval fossa and we have the tricuspid valve and um, which leaflet is this? Septal and then this one. What? Anterior, and then, so what would be, this is really a pain in the ass. Uh, what would be right in, through the wall here? AV. Um, yes, AV node, for those who are in membranous septum. For the, for the echo people, it's the membranous septum, and for the uh, electrophysiologist, it's the AV node. And then if we come here, so we have the IV, the inferior cable vein, the superior cable vein, and then what is this? Eustachian ridge. And this is, uh, is this is down here by the tricuspid valve. The right Appendage of the right atrium has been opened up. It's off the screen, it's been lifted up. So this is what, the Bethian vein is down here. There's actually even an arrow to it. So this would be the famous, um, the famous what? Uh, this is the tendon of Totoro, and then it's pointing up to the um, to the membranous septum of an AV node area. So IVC down here, Eustachian ridge, the Bethian vein, <coughs> the Bethian valve, coronary sinus, and the the uh, uh, the so-called tendon of Totoro, which is really simply an extension of the eustachian ridge. And then your isthmus would be here between the coronary sinus and the septal leaflet. Not your isthmus, but this person's isthmus. But this person doesn't really care anymore for his isthmus. <laughs> that, was, that was a while ago. So now back, now that we've kind of named things, so let's think about, is this orient, do we like this orientation or do we like this orientation? Or how the heart would sit in the chest. If we think of these, if we think of these structures as we would visualize them, if we took a medical student, ripped open their chest, and incised the right atrium, because what else are you going to do with the medical students? They can't write notes anymore. So what is the point? 
So which one do you like? Yes. Yes. And, and what could be more logical than that the inferior cable vein comes from below and the superior vena cable vein comes from above. So this is the conventional orientation and this is the conventional naming orientation, but it's much easier to think of things or maybe it's easier. I've, I've found it helpful at times, once in a while, never. When, when we imagine the structures in their normal uh, uh, place, situs, which is just place in Latin. So, so that now we've kind of thought about the structures in their relationship uh, to how they appear. Let, let's think about the atrium as a whole, just for a while, just because I like this slide and I wanted to include it. Um, okay, here's a question for you. Here's a question for Anke. What exactly is a vestibule? Uh, actually, that's the atrium. But yes, so it's this. It, it, it is a uh, passageway, a, a, a small passageway into the ventricle, and it has smooth walls. And what's interesting about the two atria are quite different in their in their anatomy. So what's interesting about the right atrium, well, it's not that interesting, but what's remarkable, what's, uh, what you have to know about the right atrium, whether you want to or not, <laughs> is that it goes from smooth to rough to smooth. And the vestibule is a relative, what you think of the isthmus is part of, is, what the, is the part of the vestibule that's of interest to EP, okay? So it's smooth walled, it leads to the tricuspid annulus, and it connects the muscle of the appendage to the atrium, and it has a somewhat distinct uh, embryologic origin from the appendage. What about the sinus? So the famous sinus. So the right atrium has another component, which is called the, the sinus, and this contains the two what? The two cava, yeah. Did you say the two cables? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so we have the, so, so that's all we're going to say about that. We're going to, well, actually, we're going to talk about this endlessly for the next hour. Uh, and we'll talk about coronary sinus another day, we're, even though we can't, we can, I decided when I got to slide 28, I realized we're never going to cover this. So we'll, we'll put it off. Let, let's go back to embryology a little bit. So we start out as wormy, disgusting wormy things. Um, and we, the truncus arteriosus becomes, guess what, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And we have the, the outlet, which becomes the outlet of the right ventricle. We have um, the inlet, which becomes the left ventricle. And then we have the atrium and the sinus venosus. And then there are uh, veins, but, but we don't, you can no, you get overwhelmed with the number of anatomic parts. So we'll just say that, that there are veins, two veins entering the right and the left horns. We're not going to worry about the left horn of the sinus of Valsalva because that's sinus stenosis, because what does it do? It just goddamn goes away, just, just disappears, except when it doesn't, and we'll talk about that next time. So we're going to talk about the right horn. And then how do we get from a line, a tube, into a heart that has m more of a horizontal orientation? And the answer is you fold it on itself. And the sinus stenosis will be in the back, and that's why the cava are in the back, and it will feed into the right atrium. So now we'll be kind of a be able to Im imagine the sinus stenosis as distinct from the atrium, but connected to it, or not. I don't care. So we 
we have, just as we had with the, with the blue plastic model, we have here in this, uh, in, in, uh, this anatomic specimen, we have a smooth sinus venosus. We have a rough right atrial appendage. And here we cannot see the vestibule, but the vestibule is of less cosmic interest to us for the moment. So here's my question. What is this black dotted line? So for two points, Jason, name the black dotted line. Don't name it Bill or <laughs> Ankit or anything. Just, you have to actually name it according to what you'd see in the book. So it's, what is it? Let, for, before we name it, let's decide what it signifies or what it is a border of. What, are we, what is it the border of? The right atrial appendage and the sinus venosus. So, so if you like Latin, it's the sulcus terminalis, and if you like English, it is the um, a terminal groove. So it's the end, the terminus of what? Well, it's the terminus of, if you're going back to forwards, the sinus venosus, and if you're going front to backwards, it's the terminus of the appendage. Now, these are pulmonary veins. There's a little bit of a line here, and that's called Waterston's groove. So this is right atrium. What if we put a stick through that groove here, what would we enter? The left atrium, exactly. And just past the atrial septum. Just past the atrial septum. So that's Waterston's groove. We don't worry about Waterston's groove because we don't see it. The surgeons worry about it. Actually, that's how they often will gain, if they need to gain access, they can gain access that way. Now, what's interesting about the appendage? What, to, from where to where do the pectinate muscles go? So what is the extent of the pectinate muscles? Well, they originate from the terminal crest. And they, that's their lateral, they, they, so they spread laterally or circumferentially from there. But, but from superior to inferior, yeah, superior vena cava to inferior vena cava. And you can see that from this, in, in this cutaway where you peel back the atrial wall. So from superior vena cava to inferior vena cava. If, you, if you're lucky enough to have good imaging, this is how in congenital heart disease, you, one of the criteria for distinguishing right from left atrium, because the left atrium is quite a different origin and it is smooth, except for the pectinate muscles in, the, in a finger-like projection of an appendage. But in the right atrium, the entire, the, the wall of the atrium, the muscular atrium that does the pumping is the appendage. Now, the other thing that doesn't have any uh, clinical bearing, but is just interesting to know is look at the wall between the pectinates. It is, I'm going to shoot this thing. It is wafer thin. So the right atrium consists of these pectinate muscles with really a membrane to contain the blood apart from those muscles. So let's talk a little bit now about the uh, terminal crest, which is this thing. So the terminal crest, what is its extent from superior to inferior? We see it, and we, we, used to, we think of it in tomograms as a bump next to the superior vena cava and a darn good reason to order an MRI when, we're, when, when we need to meet the quarter's financial goals. <laughs> but is it a bump? Is it a thumb-like projection? Caution? But what is the extent of the ridge? 
and all the way to the end. So that's what you're, is. we know it starts at the SBC because we see that in every single transesophageal echo. But where does it end? And you're right, it's a little vague, so it's variable. So it starts breaking up as it approaches the floor of the atrium. It can extend, and in fact, it, it kind of has branches that go out. And one of those branches is usually continuous with what? Here by the IVC on the floor. Eustachian valve. So, so the terminal crest supports the atrium. It, it marks the, the merging of the sinus spinosis and the atrial appendage, the business end, the pumping end of the atrium. And it, it forms a C, because we're talking about a circular wall, it forms a C from superior to inferior vena cava, although with the bottom that is variable and may be broken off into different different smaller ridges, and, and then merges with the eustachian ridge. All right. So, what is the arrowhead pointing to, Katie? So, let's think about it. This thing is worthless. I'm going to touch the screen again. <laughs> So we've got atrial septum, we have RA, we are posterior in the right atrium, and the, what is the posterior part of the right atrium made of? The crest, um, sinus venosus, but this is the crest. So we have a little bit of the sinus venosus atrium, We've got the trabeculated atrium. And we can't tell that on, on this echo, right? And then we have what looks like a little mound, but is really a cross-section of a strip from top to bottom. And it can be very big, or it can be unremarkable. So in a transesophageal echo, we see it just below the superior vena cava. That makes sense. Superior vena cava, sinus spinosus, atrial appendage with pectinate, merger. And then for good measure, we have the eustachian ridge. And you can actually kind of even pretend to imagine that if we could see this going on a, a circumnavigating the atrium in a different plane, that it might make it down to the ridge. I know, I know. Okay. All right. Let's shift a little bit and let's talk more about the sinus of venosus and what it contributes to the atrium. So this, um, this is a, a, a tragic story of a very, very, very little boy who just didn't make it. And so he was sectioned into this for a book and has achieved a kind of immortality, so not so bad. But luckily, it was a boy mouse. <laughs> now, um, so we have the sinus venosus, and we have two valves. <clears throat> this, this is kind of a, four, a quasi four chamber. And here's the primary atrial septum, what, what will be the left atrium, the right atrium, endocardial cushions. So we have a left venous valve, oddly enough, and it's on, what do you think, the right or the left? Correct. Correct. And the right venous valve is on the right. And then what, what do they become? What do we do with them? Yeah? Was there a, someone wanted to hazard a, a guess? Aristotle, try to sleep with your eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can get Todd to show you how to do that. <laughs> it's not that hard. 
he did it for three years. So the left sinus, the left sinus valve merges with the atrial septum. It just goes away, except when it doesn't. The right sinus valve becomes what? Eustachian. It becomes the eustachian valve and also contributes to the Thebesian valve. And this is an even nicer picture of what we had before with the eustachian ridge. The inferior vena cava is somewhere in this picture, although not named. The tendon of Totoro, the uh, septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve leading up to the membranous septum where it has its commissure with the anterior leaflet. Shoot this thing. And the mem you can see a membranous region right here. And just under the membranous septum is where you find the AV node. Now, here's the eustachian ridge or valve, whatever you want to call it. So my question to you is, is the inferior vena cava here and below us or, beh or behind and below us? In front of the ridge? Behind the ridge. Behind the ridge. Why? Or teleologically, why is that a good thing? The ridge, the eustachian valve, is in between coronary sinus and the But the coronary sinus is actually more across. They're not quite across. They come in. I am going to shoot this thing. As we'll see in the next lecture, they come in like this. Right, so, so if they were, if it was across, it would be like this. Yes. It, yes. In 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 uh, fetal physiology, you have um, the vitellin veins carrying uh, and the umbilical veins carrying oxygenated blood from the placenta, going through this complicated, like six thousand pathway uh, thing. To, into the inferior vena cava, and you don't want that blood to go into the right ventricle. You want to bypass the lungs because there's nothing to breathe. And so the eustachian ridge will guide the blood across the oval fossa. That's why the IVC is always a straight shot into the oval fossa. All right. Here's a little case reporty from the European Heart Journal. And uh, it, it was kind of an amusing case report. So this was a 23-year-old volunteer for a study. So what are we, let's start with this. You can see that she was very hot that day. So that's why the picture is orange. <laughs> she cooled off when they took this. So what are we looking at here? What view is this? Four chamber. It's the left sided what? Um, sinus venosis that failed. It's the left sinus that no creditable guess, but that actually is not it. It's not it. Um, let's let's think about this. So we have. Go ahead. Was someone going to offer a thought? It is inferiorly angulated. You know, they didn't, if you look at the RV, they've tilted down a little bit, so we're quite inferior. This is not a standard issue four chamber. It's, a, it's inferiorly oriented. That's, um, so if it were, the, were at the coronary sinus, we'd have to be below the left atrium, and we'd see it coming in like this. Let's look at this view. I, it's the, eustachian, it's the eustachian valve. And if we look here at the IVC, then we, they, they claim that they imaged enough to show that this line went all the way across. So they have a very tall eustachian ridge, which goes all the way from the lateral wall to the septum. As, and you saw in those sections that that is what the eustachian ridge does. It's continuous with the tendon of Totoro. We think of the eustachian ridge as 
a narrow flap in front of the IVC, but that's because that's how we see it in tomograms. It is, in fact, a line from the, from the IVC to the lateral wall, continuing up the lateral wall as the tendon of Totoro. And if you go inferior enough, you can, you can see that. So um, what they claim and what, to have shown in here in a 3D echo is that if you have the IVC Eustachian ridge, then if you look on, on the atrial wall, you can actually see the terminal crest joining it. I, I didn't quite catch that, if you want to know the truth. But, but it's possible, uh, it's plausible that the ter a prominent terminal crest would merge with the Eustachian ridge and go across, across the atrium from the, from, go across, as you proposed, from the IVC to the coronary sinus and then up to the tendon of Totoro. Thank God they didn't claim to have seen the tendon of Totoro. Then, of course, they wouldn't have got it published because no one would believe them. All right. Let's click on this image to zoom. Um, what is this? What do the arrows point to? It would be nice in real time, but I was too lazy to find a movie. Yeah. Right atrium, but in the right atrium. Chiari. Yeah. What was Chiari's first name? Hans. <laughs> so the Chiari network is the other remnant of the right uh, sinus, uh, uh, right valve of the sinus of the gnosis. And here you can see a very impressive Chiari. And this poor patient had uh, some blue cloth in the atrium. And then here's the Chiari at the bottom of the right atrium, inferior vena cava, oval fossa, so the straight shot. This is tilted so that we can see into, into the uh, region between the inferior vena cava and tricuspid valve. Straight shot into the oval fossa, Chiari network. Here's, the, here's a Chiari network. And the Chiari network extends from where to where? From the roof of what? <coughs> so which part is the roof? The roof is near the spine or the roof is near the aorta? Um, I, I, I think from the SCT to the It's actually the IVC. I'm sorry, IVC. So it's, it goes I, inferior vena cava over to coronary sinus. So, near, so that makes sense. The Fabesian ridge is also a remnant. It's also formed out of the sinus, uh, uh, the valve of the sinus of the gnosis. And then it can have miscellaneous attachments to the atrium. And some of them can be quite high and make you think it's heading to the superior vena cava. I've seen that. So, um, and can anybody imagine, we, had, we didn't talk about this, but uh, so you, you, well, we'll talk. Um, it's claimed that you can get endocarditis on this. So someone reported a vegetation on this. Uh, certainly, it's well known that you can trap a swan in here and, and not be able to pull it out. And you can kind of see how a catheter could get in there. And if you are twisting and turning, you could ball it up. Um, uh, and it's claimed that Somebody claims that there was a thrombus there and it's a source of stroke, but a uh, pulmonary embolus. But I find that remote. So, uh, so that is um, the Chiari network, another remnant of the left sinus of Valsalva, uh, right sinus of Valsalva valve, uh, sinus, right sinus spinosis valve, and uh, originating from the IVC following the course of that valve to the, th to the coronary sinus, the Thebesian valve, and then a, with miscellaneous attachments to the atrium, uh, to the septum. Now, is it, I've always thought of this being independent of the implantation valve. Is it coming from the same valve? It's attached to it. Are there, is it kind of, it's almost as if they're connected? 
Yeah, I didn't see anything about that, but I don't know if there's a, uh, it takes off from that ridge. But I, I don't know that it is, uh, I don't know how broad that takeoff has to be. Here, the takeoff here looks pretty narrow. How loose is it? Yeah, it looks like a, okay. or, well, it if you've ever seen them in real time, they wave up and down. So they're, they're anchored to, to the eustachian valve, to the Thebesian, and sometimes to the atrial septum. Um, but, but, the, but the body just goes, it just um, uh, moves freely. It looks like a sail. It looks, you know, it looks like a sail in a wind that is changing direction. All right, let's go on. So this pic, this this picture on the left is this is a cut through this section, anatomic section, along this solid line. So what is a septum? This is kind of like you know what, you know when is it? a door ajar, and the answer is when it's open, but, um, it's, it's what? Yeah, it actually means border or wall in Latin, and it just, it separates two chambers. So, um, so the question is, which part of this are we seeing? What do we see here that is a, that is a septum. Which part of this? Here's superior vena cava, here's atrial wall, coronary sinus, oval fossa, uh, more atrium here. What part of this is, the, is a septum? And then let's open it up to the four chamber view. So this, this is a sagittal view, and this is a four chamber. And then we're going to cut the septum here. We're going to cut through the oval fossa, right, and lift off the upper half and separate it from the bottom half. So SVC, IVC, coronary sinus, the aorta, the anterior with the aorta, and the posterior with the, with the cava. And then here's the, here's the cut oval fossa. So which part of this from here to here is a true septum if we accept that a septum is a single wall dividing two chambers. The rim, the rim of... This. So you would find septum here? So, you know, I always feel like there's a little wordplay with this. But actually, this is a fold. And if, you, if I were to take a sharp object and poke it through here, it would enter this area, and it would be outside the heart. If I kept going through the fold on the other side, I would hit atrium. The only part, this is mostly true, true enough. The only part that is a true septum such that if I penetrate a single wall and I, that I will find myself in the left atrium is in fact the oval fossa. It's not exactly true. There's a little bit of another septum, but maybe we'll cover that another day. It, it's too, it gets too fussy to go into. So for, for a reasonable working definition is that the only true septum is in fact the oval fossa. Let's look at that again, because I know how fascinated you are by this. So here, you can see better that the so-called second septum, I don't know if it's so-called, but I mean, that is what we call it, but it's not a septum. So the, the infolding of the superior atrial wall is what we call the second septum. So, of course, this leads to the idea that it's a true septum. And the point would be that if you are doing a uh, Brockenbrow procedure and you say, well, it doesn't matter if I hit the oval fossa, I can hit the, se the, se uh, the second septum, 
It does matter because you are going into the mediastinum. The same is almost, almost equally true of the anterior rim. Again, an infolding of the wall. Here we're up in the LVOT. It says aortic root, but to me it looks like LVOT. But the point is it's anterior. You know that the aorta is anterior. So uh, there, there is a little bit of muscle here that in fact is a true septum, but it's just, it's not that important. If we look here, this is an even more dramatic example with, uh, and I'm not sure why the tissues have come apart in, in, the, in this fold, but this is all a fold. This is the oval fossa, the true septum. And then the, the anterior fold is not as, is not as dramatic. But this is, an, this is a giant fold. Next to it is the superior vena cava. So the second, the second septum is adjacent to the superior vena cava. And we're going to come to that because when we think about defects mm -hmm. or atrial communications, that's going to play a role. So we have sinus venosus, we have infolding of the atrial wall, and we have left atrium. Yeah? So the origin of the crest, did that kind of come from the infolding? Uh, the, the That's my understanding. Okay. The terminal crest. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what can go, what is an example of this? In, that we encounter all the time, but we don't think about. And that is lipomatous infiltration. So it's called lipomatous hypertrophy, but it's not hypertrophy. We don't have, we don't work out the, the fat cells and they get bigger, maybe. It's possible. And actually, I take that back. So why, here, here it is on a 3D echo, this dumb, famous dumbbell shape superior, inferior group, um, infolding, superior, inferior, in a pathologic specimen. Why is the oval fossa spared? Because it's simply a membrane. This, there's fat between the atrial walls. You can put more fat there. You can't put fat, you can't inject fat into the into the oval fossa. There's no way to get fat in there. So if you have thickening or of the oval fossa, then something has to be laid down on it, like amyloid. But if you have fat infiltrating the area, it, it only infiltrates where it already is naturally. I'm not aware of anybody managing to get fat to infiltrate. A, 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 the membrane of the, the primary septum, which is the floor of the oval fossa. All right, so here's a question. So what is the difference between a PFO and a natural septal defect? a secundum atrial septal defect, right? So don't worry about all the complicated septal defects. PFO, secundum ASD. What is the difference? They both are gaps. They're, they're, I mean, they're both holes. They both allow communication between the left atrium and the right atrium. They both vote in primaries. The PFO is uh, a possible balance, right? No, no, they both involve the oval fossa. It's not within the sinus stenosis component. No, not within the sinus the failure of the fusion of the ridge. Of the primary septum. So when the primary septum doesn't fuse with the, with the secondary septum, which we agree is the septum, you get an oval fossa. Right. So one is that you have enough tissue to close the hole, but it doesn't seal. 
The other is a deficiency. You don't have enough primary septum. The primary septum simply didn't get big enough to close the uh, septum secundum, the um, uh, second hole, whatever that's called. For, yeah, frame and secundum. The second, I like the second hole because it's, it's easier to remember. Maybe, all right, but we're not 14, so let's watch that. Um, what is the light here? That's the oval fossa. So if you flash, if you shine a light in the left atrium, the only, the only part you'll see is through the oval fossa. The rest of it is too thick because of the infolding, and you, and you can't see the light. So here there's a deficient rim, the, rim, the, oh, the primary septum too small. Here, the primary septum is big enough, but it doesn't seal. So that's, that's a PFO versus a secundum ASD. It's not just a deficiency still of the primary septum, not the infolding? I imagine, you know, I didn't come across any examples of that, but I imagine it could be. Actually, it can be. No, I take it back. It can be. Yeah, because, because you need to pay attention. Uh, oh, we're going to talk, we'll talk about that, I think, soon. Or not, as the case may be. I think I may have taken something out. So what can go wrong with this? This is, this is not a major issue, but it's just interesting when things go wrong in development and you end up with, uh, with an abnormality. So this is an episcopic picture of a mouse embryo heart. I have no idea what episcopic means. We have the, we have the, sec the infolding here. It's in a four, cut in a four-chamber view, of course. Infolding here. This is the primary septum. What happened? Yeah, it inserted into the left atrium. So now we have a, a, we have a second septum and a primary septum. If this fails to seal, you have a PFO. And then here on a 3D echo, you, you see one ridge here, and then the dark blue ridge is behind it. You get one, one ridge here and another ridge behind it. I'm going to shoot this thing. So they call it a spiral septum, although I can't imagine it in 3D as to why it's spiral. But you can see that there are two Oh, If there's an orifice up here, then you would have how would you position a device? So you can actually not, these can be big enough, the separation between the primary septum and the second septum, where, where you have the primary, uh, you have the primary septum partly in, inserting on the second septum, partly into the roof of the atrium. There's no way to position a device to close that. This will, no, this is done. This is found in, a, this is an adult. This, this is a mouse embryo. And we don't have anything to, and mice don't have insurance, so we don't try to make it. <laughs> so here's a secundum ASD, and you were asking about the different, uh, whether the second septum could be, could be deficient. And, and yes, uh, so here's the atrial septal defect in the oval fossa position. Here's the aorta. So we have an anterior rim and a, uh, superior, a, a superior rim and a posterior rim and an inferior rim, and actually they count six rims. So you, you, you kind of go around all the way. So the, the uh, superior rim may be deficient. That infolding may not infold enough. And in that case, it almost looks like this ASD extends right up to the superior vena cava, and you might think you're dealing with a sinus stenosis ASD, because you can see the superior vena cava, but it's just an absent rim. All right, let's, yeah. No, no, we're, let, let's wait, because we're going to do oh, sign, that's, that's the next subject. Right. So let's think about the cable, the relationship of the superior vena cava and the pulmonary veins. All right, have you thought about it yet? No? So, <clears throat> J. 
Jessica, what is this? This is the FCC, and this? Thank you, Cephalic Dane, coming in. Okay, all right. And we got the IVC here and the right atrium. And this? Uh, left atrium with pulmonary veins coming in. Let's go over here. Let's to rotate this. And now we see it from the back instead of the front. So which vein is this? Left atrium? Right upper. Right upper. And this? Okay, so... Notice how closely related here, I think it comes out better here, how closely related that right upper pulmonary vein is to the SCC, to the sinus venosus. So if we have a defect in the formation of the sinus venosus, it can affect its relationship with the right upper pulmonary vein. They come from different sources. I, they're not formed together, but they are adjacent. They lie adjacent to each other and they touch each other and they need to have an intact septum. So if we look here, I'm lost, where are we? Oh yes, okay. This stick or probe, whatever you wanna call it, is running through the anterior, the posterior to anterior groove formed by the infolding of the atrium, the septum secundum. This is between the, the arms, the muscular arms of the second septum. This is where the SVC comes in. So I don't know if you can, have, the depth perception is hard here, but you can see that there's an SVC that's been opened. It's coming down. What's it coming down to? It's coming down to the to the to the atrium to the to the top of the atrial septum. From behind, we have pulmonary veins. This problem isn't in the atrial septum. It isn't in the appendage part of the atrium. It is in the way the sinus venosus connects to that. So in, real, in reality, the sinus venosus ASDs are outside, outside the atrium. But the sinus venosus connection to the atrium is where the defect is. So if we look up here, we, it's a little easier to see this as the SVC. We look, here's the oval fossa. Way up here, here's the atrium. Way up here, where the SVC joins the right atrium, is where we have the defect. And the pulmonary veins are often involved in that because they are adjacent to the sinus. And there's malformation of that whole unit, that whole entrance of the right pulmonary vein to the left atrium as it crosses the superior vena cava and the superior vena cava into the atrium. So this is what it looks like on CT, and these are several different patients. So here, if you saw this, you might say, well, gee, it's kind of a four-chamber view. We see the atrial septum. There's no ridge back here. Could this be a secundum ASD? But if you come up, you say, no, here's the SVC. There's the left atrium, and uh, you can see that the SVC is in communication, that there, sh there, should be, there should have been demarcation, a wall between the SVC and the left atrium to allow that through. The right atrium would communicate by coming up and over the atrial septum into the left atrium. Here in a sagittal view, coronal view, you have the pulmonary artery, we don't care about that. We have the defect below it, we have the atrial septum, and it looks thick because it's the infolded part. Then you have the oval fossa and the inferior fold. So again, out above the, the atrium. 
Yeah. A few questions from general guest of the SPC. Yes. So if you did a shunt run and you started in the mid at right atrium, you, it, would, it would be high, but you wouldn't see where it comes from. To see where it comes from, you have to be high in the SBC, uh, above where the pulmonary vein enters the SBC. You're going to really have to start almost in the brachiocephalic vein. No, because of um, uh, the, the SBC and IBC have different oxygen saturations because the, the kidneys don't uh, don't use much oxygen, so they have very high oxygen. All right. So um, here's what it looks like on TE. It's a little bit less con more confusing, but the the infolded atrial septum simply comes to an end. SBC at the opening of the SBC, we have a communication where it didn't seal, allowing the left atrium to get access to the mouth of the SBC. So it's really a mouth of the SBC defect. And oh, this, this is a pulmonary vein with a little rotation. You can see the pulmonary vein coming into the SBC. And that's what we, all, we look for that. So this is why sinus venosus ASDs, as a rule, have anomalous venous return. Whereas it's much less common with a secundum ASD because the pulmonary vein and the SVC have nothing to do with the secundum ASD. And we can do the same thing for the inferior veins. So we have an, inf that's still the sinus venosus. If we take the entrance of the inferior vena cava from the sinus venosus, we put a hole in that entrance and we involve the right lower pulmonary veins, we have an inferior defect. Now, it turns out uh, that usually the pulmonary veins enter the atrium directly in an inferior sinus venosus ASD. But we have, we have the same issue here. We have the inferior defect, the inferior vena cava, if you can imagine, coming in like this, and where it joins the atrium, there's a defect. An anomalous venous return means well, that the that 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 anatomically the pulmonary vein enters a structure it doesn't belong that other than the left atrium. So so it's anomalous because the pulmonary vein enters a superior vena cava, as opposed to drainage. So if you have if you have an, if you don't if there are sinus venosus ASDs where the right upper pulmonary vein enters the left atrium normally but it will drain, because of the of blood flow, it will drain across to the right atrium. So there is a distinction between anomalous return, an anatomic connection, and anomalous drainage. Is that, does that, not even close to what you're asking? No, that's, I guess, because you call both there's anomalous venous return in them, and then something else is the anomalous venous return so there's an atrial communication right. that an anomalous venous return does not imply can exist without an atrial communication. All right, I think uh, this is just a CT of the same. Okay, we're done. You all look pretty bored. So there's summary slides, but I won't read them to you. All right, so this is the first time uh, I've given a talk on anatomy. So is this helpful or? Oh, well, it, it it is dizzying, isn't it? What were the were, now? How about the uh, pathologic sections? Were those good, or should we? Have? Okay. All right. Okay. So I was going to do the left atrium next time, and then I'm, and what about tying in the congenital defects? Good. Okay.
All right. Do we have the slides? Uh, Elizabeth has them. So my, um, you know what? Can I pull this out without? Do I have to? Uh, where's the quiz? Yeah, when it's in there, man. Oh really? It's one barely. All right, so I can give this to Elizabeth, and she can. Yeah. She has. She has. I, this is upgraded from the one I gave to Elizabeth, yeah, so and then she can give it to you. And I think that's the issue. Oh, you don't have to see it.